All right. Good morning. Welcome to our seminar from LibreHub uh, seminar series. Today we welcome Esteban Vera, who is um, uh, Dr. Vera um, received a, a bachelor degree in engineering um, <clears throat> and a master's degree and, and PhD in, in electrical engineering as well, um, all from the University of Concepcion. Uh, then he worked as an electronics engineer for telescope projects in Paraná and Gemini. And then he did a postdoc at uh, University of Arizona and also worked at uh, Duke University. He, uh, since 2016, he's uh, at the School of Electrical Engineering at uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso in Chile, where he's now an associate professor. So his uh, interests uh, in research are in computational imaging, compressed sensing, inverse problems. And <clears throat> he's also an associate editor for Optics Express and for the IEEE Open Journal on Signal Processing. So we give a, a warm welcome to Dr. Vera and uh, we will have today uh, his talk in the topic of uh, low cost Fourier tachography microscopy. So welcome, Esteban, and please um, share your screen so we see your presentation. All right, thank you so much. Do you guys see the presentation? Uh, not just yet. No, okay. can you share again? I should I share again? Okay, let me do it. Now we see your screen with the PowerPoint. And now it's the presentation. It's, it looks okay. fine. Okay. okay, thank you guys. Thank you, Tobias and Vicente for the invitation. Um, I'm very glad to, do, to talk to you today and, and share a little bit of what we've been doing. Uh, so basically, uh, we work mostly on computational imaging at our lab, and um, we got into the Fourier tachography as a more as a curiosity exploration uh, for one of our undergrads. So let me share a little bit of that. So first of all, uh, why, why, why doing this uh, Fourier tachography or why, why so much interest also in microscopy? Of course, you guys are, are mostly into it, you know, biological imaging kind of things. Uh, but uh, through the years, we always ha have these, you know, pretensions that we, we would like to see it all. Yeah, we want to see wide field of views at the high resolution. We want the best of both worlds, but uh, unfortunately, I mean, that's not the reality. Yeah. So whenever you want to do, uh, you know, pathology applications or very wide field kind of explorations, um, you're uh, confined to low resolution. Uh, or if you want high resolution, then you have to go through scanning uh, some sort. So, so you have to, to give up a dimensionality. Yeah? You, you either give spatial dimensionality or give away some temporal resolution. Yeah, in case you're, you're, you're trying to observe dynamic things. So you, we are in this battle yeah, of field of view and resolution, especially in microscopy where it's, it's very, very sensitive. I mean, depending on the objectives you, you want to switch on all that kind of things. So, so really that, that, that's the issue. Yeah, so we want to see it all hopefully at the, at the highest resolution and, and as a trade-off, we cannot really uh, do it with, with the traditional uh, optics uh, in mind. So what, what we do know is that we can actually observe, you know, doing a, using a low magnification objective. I mean, we cannot actually observe a, a wide field of view, but of course uh, our resolution will be poor. Um, just like the example here. So instead, I mean, if you go with a high resolution, I mean, a high mag magnification objective, then you will get a very small field of view, but of course you're getting the, the aim at resolution. So how, how can you get a wide field of view and high resolution? And, and then we, we start seeing that uh, we, we want to really enhance, I mean, the, the, the the, the, the space bandwidth product of, of your system, of your optical system. So people have been 
battling with this, I mean, since the 80s, when, 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 when the Professor Huang at Illinois, I guess he, he proposed this idea of digital super resolution, yeah, where, where you basically take several uh, pictures of a low resolution uh, with a low resolution detector with, with some small shifts. And from these uh, different shifts, uh, they provide more information. And then you should be able to reconstruct a high resolution image, which is fairly uh, interesting approach. Though you you have you, you're also switching your know, temporal resolution in this in, to do this because you have to do all this. Uh, and on, on top of that, you have to use a motion uh, of some kind. I mean, you have to in, in case of my people doing this in microscopy, they have to do you know um, uh, moving your your your, let, your slide or 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 part of your optical system in order to get some of these images. But that was uh, the, the reconstruction is, is always um, uh, is, is not always the best and was kind of a um, you know it, it never show up to be a, an optimal solution for this. So what people show up is that you can also do these super resolution ideas in the frequency domain, and instead of uh, moving in this case uh, having a, a moving object or, or a moving part we can start playing with the illumination. So, and that's one advantage when you're playing with uh, with, with uh, microscopy where you basically, you need uh, illumination to do your, your, to get your images instead of, you know, when, when we are doing uh, stuff in the microscopic world. So basically in the frequency domain, we can think that the direction of the illumination is related to, 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 the, to the frequency domain of, uh, of, of, of what you're observing. So if we are illuminating the central part, so, so the, 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 the bright field yeah, of, the, of, of your object, then, then you're basically getting a, a low, low resolution version of, of your image. But then if you're illuminating with different, um, with different angles of your illumination field, so basically you're starting to move towards the, 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 the dark field. Yeah, so basically uh, you're getting other components of the Fourier domain of your, of your sample. And, and, and that's the idea behind it. So now we have this idea that we can take these low uh, resolution images, we, which were basically illuminated from, from different angles and will provide with more information in the Fourier domain. Of course, we start having some uh, signal to noise problems because as we are moving to, to, to the dark, dark side of uh, of the illumination or some very little photons we will get into the, your objective at the end, but they will be very, very informative about a high resolution part of, of the whole spectrum. So with this in mind, basically we can get, you know, a collection of a low resolution images just like before, but now we need to assign, assemble these, uh, uh, so every low resolution image will, provide you with information of different parts of the frequency domain. And now we, we can now build uh, not uh, the high resolution image directly, but we can try to uh, build the high resolution Fourier spectrum instead. And from that, using you know some sort of phase retrieval kind of algorithms, we should be able to do what they call Fourier typography microscopy. So basically just by illuminating uh, uh, with uh, with different angles, we, we can fill up this, uh, the frequency domain. And for that, people, what people propose, people from Caltech, I guess like uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, was this idea that we, we replace just your normal illumination that comes from a single angle with uh, some sort of, you know, uh, of LED arrays that we can control the illumination that's coming from. So the main idea of uh, Fourier typography is that is that is this, yeah. So basically, we, we can see here that what, what you can get with a normal, you know, uh, 10x micro microscope, which is very high resolution, very well defined, we can get a similar resolution when we recover using uh, Fourier typography. Of course, here this is an experimental result, so it's actually a real stuff working. So not it's not as good. But instead, we have, uh, the good news is that uh, we are able to do it. Uh, we can recover that 
And we can show that, you know, basically the, the main difference here is that with the 10X, we are not able to, to see the whole field of view, but with the 4X, we, we are. So it's basically a, a, a real advantage when you do this process. One of the main issues though, for people that did Fourier tachography at the first uh, time, I mean, they, they were using very sophisticated microscopes, very expensive ones. And, and the other thing is that uh, they were using, I mean, very nice uh, um, cameras, you know, uh, uh, coolant cameras, um, CCDs and very low noise. I mean, we're, they paying like 20K or 30K dollars for, for this sort of uh, systems, you know? Um, and then what, what we believe is say, okay, why you want that? I mean, one of the issues is that when you're eliminating this uh, sort of uh, dark parts, uh, then a signal to noise is an issue. And of course, I mean, if you have less noise, your inversion will be best, you know, better. But uh, you say, okay, what are the real limits? Can, can we build a Fourier tachography microscope uh, using, you know, low cost elements? I mean, this, this is one of the main triggers we were thinking of. So we say, okay, um, let's try to do one of these um, and see how, how, can, how, how it will behave, you know? Are, are we able to really do the, the inversion process even if we use very, very cheap stuff? So real tachography is basically, a, it seems to be a very simple thing. We just need to have some sort of a, um, control illumination. We can, we can get LEDs arrays and everywhere they are very cheap. Uh, we have to capture, uh, and, and for, for capture, we, we want to do a, a, a wide field of view. So we need basically, you know, low magnification uh, objectives, which are all, always on the cheap side compared to, to very high magnification ones. And, and for the capture is where, you know, we can use these fancy or expensive cameras, or we, uh, our idea was let's do, uh, let's try this Raspberry Pi camera, you know, that. Uh, has enough resolution, so, um, but of course we have quantum efficiency problems and many other things and noise. It's a, just a CMOS uh, of the shelf detector. And uh, the other side of Fourier tachography is processing. So basically we want, we need to locate uh, the Fourier spectrum of our low resolution image into the Fourier space. And th this is kind of the, uh, the core of the algorithm for, for the recovery of the high resolution image at the end. So this is an important part, which is indexing, like the, the, the position of the illumination within the array with the particular, uh, where you are in the Fourier spectrum, in the sense of the position of in the case space and also the span of, your, uh, of the Fourier spectrum, of the local one. So as we mentioned, basically, if we illuminate with the, the sort of a central element, we will get a low resolution image here, and then we have some sort of spectrum. And what we need to do is that there's a relationship between the position of your illumination and your the overall spectrum. So we have your low resolution image and we basically need to locate where we are into the spectrum. Okay, and this will fill up a piece of the, the whole spectrum. And then we do this sequentially, we basically take different, the, all the different you know, positions within the LED array, get different low resolution versions as you see, and they start to get darker, but they are more informative in the high resolution sense. So they you're really get uh, lows like uh, signal to noise and that, that's one of the issues of Fourier tachography. And then we, we need to know where this Fourier spectrum belongs. And that's part of the iterative algorithm. So we need to repeat this several times uh, with different positions and parts of the sequence. As you see, we get darker and darker and uh, uh, as we move towards the high resolution. And if we do this several times, and uh, we, the idea is that we're trying to fill up this whole high resolution Fourier spectrum of your image. And that can be done iteratively. And basically we can reconstruct magnitude and phase because we can use phase retrieval algorithms for doing that. And that would be like the equivalent low resolution image we had at, at this you know, part. And, and so that's interesting. So this is basically uh, how we started uh, with the, the software development. 
So we basically say, okay, we have a, an amplitude part, which is Lena, and we have a, a phase part, which is sort of this uh, airfield. And, and basically with that, we try to, to, to do the, our simulations first to do the software development. So basically we can see here that we, we have to identify, you know, the LED that we, we are turning on, you know, uh, and where this LED belongs into the Fourier space. And then we are trying to fill up as we run the algorithm. You know, we take this different uh, low resolution versions. So let's repeat again. So this is our simulation process. So we have the high resolution image and basically we, we, what we have with the LED matrix is basically where we, need, we are sampling the Fourier spectrum of the high resolution image. And we are generating with, from each one of these, uh, um, of the illumination points, we are basically getting one low resolution image, which is actually what, what we are getting from our simulator. Okay, so that's basically the whole uh, forward uh, process. And that's trying to replicate what we, what we should get in, in, in the microscope. With that said, basically what we need to do now is the recovery algorithm, which will try to you know, fill up now the, 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 the spectrum. So using the Fourier transform of every low resolution image, we try to paint and, and basically concatenate. We are doing like a, a mosaic, mosaicing of the uh, Fourier spectrum, of the high resolution Fourier spectrum. And from that, we see that we are recovering the high resolution image every time that the details start to show up. And we are also recovering the face. Of course, there's some degree of ambiguity that you can see. I mean, you can recognize some of the phase elements into the magnitude, but that's a normal thing in every phase retrieval algorithm. It's kind of a, a very tough process. So, but that, that was all developed at the beginning by, by the same guys that invented it. So, so we are not really re, re, reinventing the wheel here. We are basically just uh, setting it up for, for our, our low budget uh, problem. So the idea is that, I mean, this will be like a, one of the low resolution versions just with the central illumination. And that will be like the reconstruction that we can get. That's what we want to get from our low cost version. Let's see if that's feasible. So for our development, we basically started to plan, okay, how to deal with the distances and, and, and try to see if we, if we can. So we basically define to use um, what we have in hand, which was a 4X Olympus um, objective, which is sort of a kind of a cheap one. We, we can get uh, equivalent ones, I mean, for, I mean, this one costs maybe $200 and we can get equivalent one, ones for 30 bucks. And we get the distances, you know, uh, for, for between the objective and the sample and the sample and the illumination and from the objective also to the detect. And that was all a try and error thing of, of the student. And so we get uh, a LED array that was controlled by an Arduino uh, samples that you can get. This is our apoplanatic um, 4x uh, objective. And then we have a Raspberry Pi, which will be our computer uh, that it's controlling our camera. So with that, I mean, the same Raspberry Pi can send commands to the Arduino to, you know, synchronize, you know, the illumination and the acquisition of the images. So with that, basically uh, just put it upside down and develop the, this kit, which it was basically, uh, this is mostly, you know, printed 3D parts, you know, that we, we, we can place all these elements, plus some, some, some sticks that were used for, for a variety of school projects, you know, that's wood sticks. And then we, we have some controls for, for different things. So we have these sticks that basically we can level you know, the LED matrix. We, we have some focusing handles for, for, for the slides. We have a slide support that was uh, 3D printed. We have the objective lens. We have a, a tube. We have some printed sticks and tube support so we can have all these. And we have a, a holder 
And then on the bottom, we have the Raspberry Pi box. So that's basically our, 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 our kit development process that, that we had in mind. And so after we define the distances, and then we can do some fine adjustments uh, on the fly. So basically the, the whole process, um, we, we have uh, to, to separate, uh, sorry for, for this slide that's in Spanish. And so uh, one is the, the hardware side, uh, the imaging side and the software side. So, so basically, uh, on the hardware side, we basically we just coordinate, you know, the, the the Raspberry Pi coordinates, you know, the Arduino. So MATLAB coordinate both, and so the Raspberry is connected to the Arduino, and and then we we, we basically take uh, different illuminations and different captures, and with that we just you know we send all these uh, through the, through a cloud through a computer, and we just use MATLAB with with the reconstruction algorithm and generate a high resolution image. So yeah, we send commands to the Arduino, send commands to the Raspberry Pi, we take the images, we store them, and then we recover the image. That's the whole process. So we also develop a, a, a software for the kit where we can you know, uh, change different things and change you know, the, you know, the illumination patterns and the sequence and, and many other uh, things that are switchable in the algorithm. So that's all available. And also we evaluated the, the kit costs. So how much we will spend for any one of these kits. And we see uh, two versions here. One, one is the, 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 the first on, on the left is, uh, is in, the, in the American um, market, basically. Yeah, we get a, a very nice Olympus objective lens by $130, which was the, the bulk of the cost. Uh, and then the Raspberry Pi and the LED and, and many other things. So we have that if we get this system with a, you know with this Olympus objective uh, in the US, we will pay like $270, almost $300. But we can get a very equivalent one uh, because most of the hardware will be the same price. Uh, of course, the LED matrix will be cheaper if we get it in AliExpress in China. And of course, we can get equivalent uh, objectives because you know, it doesn't need to be the, the best one in the world. So we, we can lower down the cost uh, almost to, to $100. And we've been iterating this process and we are, we are getting almost close to $200 if we get it in AliExpress in, in China. So we, we can basically 3D print. I mean, that's, that's every time cheaper. So that's the overall uh, version we have now. So. Um, and that's the, the kit development process. And, and this is what we actually built in the lab. And, and we finally were able to test if it, it's worthwhile to do it or not. So we, we thought about this as an educational kind of kit that we can you know, even build and, and, and give it to schools. Because I mean, what's interesting here is not only, on, oh, we are doing microscopy. I mean, maybe anybody can do microscopy, achieve microscopy, even with a cell phone. But, but the main thing is here is really thinking about reconstruction, that we have more information than we think, you know, and, and, and that, uh, that the guys can see, you know, that um, the power of signal processing as well. So we really want to do, uh, put this into the mind of the students, not only, you know, how we can get a nice image, you know, but uh, see all these trade-offs in, in first hand. So that, that was the main thing. So for our experiments, we basically took images, uh, we use our LED array was a color one. So we have a RGB, uh, RGB LEDs in, within every LED here. So, so we take nine images per color. So basically very small, you know, three by three array. Uh, we took, took some dark images for calibration. That's a very important process. Otherwise uh, we couldn't get any, any uh, reconstructions. We do, we do some five iterations of the algorithm, which is not that, that, that slow. And we target a resolution of uh, 1K by 1K. So basically we, we're illuminating this uh, calibration target, which is you know, a very universal thing to, to test. And um, this is our low resolution version. And that will be our reconstructed version using our microscope. So we can see that if, if we just take the low resolution and compare it to our high resolution reconstructed with these nine LEDs, 
we can see that increase in, in resolution when we try to see the, the lines here. You see that in the red line, we can see better the pumps and, 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 and really define, you know, that we have transitions between these resolution uh, lines. So that was very interesting. And the, of course, we, we didn't have the best definition that was used in the plane uh, algorithm. We mentioned you guys that, I mean, noise would be an issue. I mean, especially we are using this very cheap Raspberry Pi camera, but that can also be improved by some improving our digital processing as well. So basically, if we just take the, the image with the low resolution, we just, let's say just the, the, the middle uh, illumination part, uh, we will get resolve up to, you know, three microns and we can lower it down to two microns, basically, if we do the, the, the typography. So basically we have a, a, an increase in the space mandate product of uh, a 40%. So that's very nice because we're only using, you know, a three by three array, we can use a five by five, we can get uh, some slight improvement uh, further, but of course we are getting more noise. So we have to trade off a little bit with that. But at least we were able to show that, I mean, there's an increase in space bandwidth. We did some tests now with some blood samples where we were able to, to see some improvements, of course, and even in color. In color, we have also other artifacts, you know, it's very difficult. Uh, we always get some chromatic effects uh, at the end of the day, because also the, 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 the different uh, RGB LEDs inside a, a, a pixel of the, your, you know, LED array, the, it's not necessarily in the same position. So that also gives you some, some, some differences. Okay, so, but that was just basically to show that we are able to, to you know, this is just uh, on the left, we have like the low resolution version and on the right, the reconstructed high resolution, we can get, uh, in this case, what just a slight improvement, but we know we can get better. But basically the whole idea behind this kit is really uh, as a demonstrational thing, you know, that we are able to improve the resolution. Okay, so we, we, you can check our, um, um, this was the work of uh, my undergrad, which is now my PhD student, Felipe. Um, so, so basically he, he published this in, in two conferences and we, we, have, we are basically our conclusions of this work was that we were able to develop a low, kiss, low, low cost kit for your uh, typography microscope. Um, so that, that's one, one thing that we are able to do. We develop a, cust uh, a customizable acquisition and reconstruction software, you know, that can adapt to different kit implementations. And we are also able to demonstrate the feasibility of reconstructing this high resolution wide field of view uh, images uh, using this kit. So that, that was the, the news about it. Uh, further work, I mean, if we're able to, to, to keep working on this, is improving the kit, of course, and implementing reconstruction algorithm inside the Raspberry Pi because we were doing just in the computer. But of course, that might be too slow. Then we have to optimize more things. The other thing is that we can boost accelerate yeah, the acquisition time uh, by using uh, coded multiplexing illumination that can also help uh, with, um, with signal to noise. And of course, uh, we can, instead of using a Raspberry Pi, we can move to an NVIDIA Jetson, which is a slightly improved, you know, embedded system for some extra dollars if we want to pay. And then we can include some deep learning reconstruction algorithms that give way, way, way better results. Although, you know, deep learning has some issues with people working in, in biology, especially because you, in biology, you don't want to invent, you don't, you really don't want to invent data. Yeah, you want to see uh, real things and, and that's a, a big issue of our discussion. So anyway, just to finish, just a, a, a brief uh, uh, thing about uh, what we do in our lab, basically, um, as I, the guys mentioned at the beginning, uh, we work mostly on computational imaging. Most of my projects are into more of the microscopic world. Uh, we try to design these ideas of, uh, you know, measuring as many uh, properties of light as possible with the fewer resources as possible. That's our, our main motto. We've been working with more gigapixel cameras, or so we are more into the micro micro microscopic world. Uh, we do lots of compressive imaging and also uh, working a lot in wave sensing, mostly in astronomical applications, 
but we're also in, interested in seeing how, how some of these ideas have been permeating towards you know, bi biological imaging. Although, I mean, I'm not into the biological imaging side. So even uh, the dichography thing, we are thinking about macroscopic dichography problems uh, right now. So any, anyway, this is sort of the things we've been doing today, which is a compressive temporal imaging. Is the idea of basically taking from, from one shot that you can see on the left here, we can reconstruct several events in time. So we can talk about this any any other talk in the future. Okay, thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward for any questions. Thanks so much, uh, Esteban. That, that's a very uh, fascinating uh, implementation of the Fourier tachography. And it, it's incredible to hear that it's so cheap you could even bring it to, to schools, as you said, or something like that. So I had a lot of questions. Maybe I can start with um, one. So you said we uh, you you need um, offline processing of the data, right? So the kit only acquires the data, but then you have to process it in the computer to reconstruct images. So how long does that take? But basically, it's just one minute. Uh, so the, the acquisition process takes, you know, um, depending on the exposure time we use. I mean. It takes, you know, it is very, very fast. I mean, if you take nine images per color, that, that would be like 27 images. Uh, you can basically do that in, in, you know, a few seconds. And the re reconstruction takes uh, took like, you know, less than a minute. So the, is there a reconstruction, would it be possible to implement it in the um, onboard computer that does the acquisition or that's um, too difficult? Yeah, so it's not that hard. I mean, um, especially that, you know, the Raspberry Pi has been evolving within the years. And we are using like, I think it was one of the first versions. So it was very, very basic and naive. So what's kind of hard. The thing is we, we have to switch some of our algorithms to C. So, so we had it in MATLAB, so we need to do it quickly. So it's, it's not that hard. I mean, the algorithm is, itself is not difficult. I mean, it's basically lots, lots, and lots of Fourier transforms. So basically, that, that's the core limitation. But with the last version of the uh, Raspberry Pi, I, I guess it would be very, very suitable. I mean, to to do it. Good. Thanks. So we had a, a question here from. Um, so um, China. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your yeah, name that, that's right, right. do you want to speak up Go ahead. yeah uh, i recently uh, come across the paper which i uh, kept here the on the for your photography and it looks a uh, similar system so i would like to know uh, how it compares to your system so for example uh, it also uses the raspberry pi and you know uh, same led types but uses uh, smaller uh, it looks quite compact compared to the very big kit you showed and i would like to know what are the advantages and disadvantages while designing it for the educational purposes yeah i, I haven't seen it i, I, I guess mo most of the uh, you know distances and stuff uh, was basically uh, it, it's really up to your you know let's say the detector size that you have um how you want to project your image. I mean, it, it really, uh, it, it will tell you about what, what will be the length of your tube, yeah? Um, so it really depends. I mean, what detector you have, I mean, what's the pixel size and all the kind of things, how many pixels you want to illuminate and uh, to see, I mean, the length of the tube. And then, you know, the distances also from, from the illumination to, to, the, uh, to your target and then to the, to the objective also, we play um, a role here because, I mean, you you want uh, one of the issues is that if you have using this planar LED array, so basically your illumination pattern basically will start from there. So it really depends. Um, you will get less light from 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 the parts that are not central. So there are people today that is even using like a curve, you know, illumination pattern. Uh, or LED array in order to, to make make sure that you know most of the energy of, of your LED goes through the center of the objective. So mm -hmm. there, there's uh, lots of things that you can really optimize. I mean, we you you can make it uh, you can make it a shorter 
uh, as you as you want, but then you have to be careful about okay, what's the size of the detector you're using? Can you know this is a trade-off thing? I mean, uh, all the time. So it really depends on the objective you're using. Maybe you're not using for X. Maybe you're using one X. Um, so then, then then you can you can play things. Uh, on that note, uh, f does your work publish anywhere to know the software, uh, particularly regarding the software? I'm interested if it is open source. Oh yeah, so so we basically took it from from the the guys who who did, who did it. So uh, at Caltech, they, they 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 leave it open. So basically adapted and 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 made all the acquisition part of it. Um, so, so we have it all in one. So basically you press a button and you put your parameters. Yeah, so um, basically take the acquisition of your system, uh, take the images and then do the reconstruction and using the algorithm they, they already had. So we have it, you know, we don't have it in a platform. Like, you know, I don't know if it, Felipe may be published in some port or some place, but we have it available. If you, if you want it, we just uh, send it to you, no problem. Okay, yeah, I'm interested, I can draw. I just wanted to add to this briefly, sorry, um, because we actually tried to replicate the system that you mentioned in the in the publication. So I can comment on this a little bit. It's not my design, but we tried to build it with um, the biotope sort of bio um, maker community in Heidelberg a couple of years ago. And we, um, yeah, I also have all the all the parts ready, and we have them in our institute as well. And we tried to put it together, and there are some. So that that paper is very difficult to reproduce or has been difficult for us to reproduce. So that's basically the bottom line. So right. um, there are different kinds of codes. So there are different softwares that sort of talk to each other. So it's not really one analysis pipeline. Um, it's been very computational expensive to run. So it, well, actually the code overall did not run like that. So then we used code from elsewhere to actually make it work at all. Um, so we try to fix up the code. The code is difficult to get, so it's not really published. So you need to contact the authors. They can give you the code, but um, we didn't manage to make it run. So it was too complicated and too error from the pipeline for, for our experience. So maybe on a different computer it would have worked. I, I can't, you know, I don't want to say that it's sort of bad overall. But, and that's of course completely lensless. Well, it's not, they say lensless in the title, but actually it's not completely lensless because they still use the lens of the Raspberry Pi um, camera module, uh, but it doesn't have an objective. So the resolution, they, well, they say they get a pretty good resolution, but probably if you, if you have an objective, you can get an even better resolution. They also use all the LEDs of their camera panel, of their LED panel. So they don't just use three by three, but they use 16 by 16. Um, and I think that, Hat is really cool. It goes right on the Raspberry Pi. So that's also what we are trying to use at the moment. Uh, the 16 by 16 panel that goes right on the Raspberry Hat is a Raspberry Pi hat. So you don't need an extra Arduino and you have a lot of LED pixels to work with. So these are just a couple of thoughts on that particular paper. So I, what we are trying to do is to use, to, to utilize some of the things that we think were good in that work. Um, other things uh, we do differently, especially for example, the if you do use an objective, you need to um, focus a little bit on your sample. And I think the Z uh, focus mechanism also in that paper that you mentioned is, is a little bit tricky. Um, so you need a special screw, but even then getting it right is, is difficult. So there we use um, the focus mechanism from the UC2 framework or from the open flexure microscope. So, so let us go back to the, we have some questions. Um, yes. uh, I ask everyone to raise their hand and I think we'll have plenty of time to uh, come back in more detail to, to some of these topics. So um, Andrea, do you have a question? We can't hear you, Andrea. Um, there's some problem with Can you hear mind. me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, awesome, awesome, perfect. Uh, yeah, the new, the new earphones. Okay, thanks, Esteban, for the nice presentation. I wanted to ask you, you know, in, in biology, we mostly use uh, for eye accuracy, precision localization, AP illumination with, combined with fluorescence. I wanted to ask you if there is a solution based on the same principle 
to adapt your system to epi illumination. I was thinking maybe something like uh, micro lenses in front of the detection. Maybe to clarify, um, are we talking about, I think Esteban was uh, talking about transmission light, right? Andrea, yeah, are you talking about exactly. fluorescence or also yes, transmitted yes, light? Yes, 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 yes. Epi-illumination instead of transmission. But with fluorescence or not necessarily yeah. with fluorescence? Yeah, with fluorescence. Fluorescence, okay. All right. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, we can actually, I mean, you can move it further. I mean, one of the things, I mean, uh, if, I mean, fluorescence by itself, you know, you, you can really beat, you know, a resolution limits just, you know, by, by doing all these tricks, you know, that people do. Uh, but uh, if you want, basically, tachography was to, to, to improve, you know, resolution and, uh, I know that there's people working on, on reflective, uh, you know, typography, which is kind of a tricky thing as well. I mean, you can have the system, you can build the system, uh, but then um, you have other effects as well. Uh, so you have the, so it's more, more a matter of, uh, you know, whether, uh, you know, reflective typography is, is something people have worked out and they have sorted out. And it's just some, a matter of, you know, we, we, we just put some LEDs or, or in this case, uh, maybe lasers or, I mean, people, I mean, do mostly confocal things, but, uh, but if you want to improve the resolution, I don't know if it's necessarily for, for fluorescence, but basically invert, you know, the, your LED array, but you have to give uh, room, you know, for, for your, your detector still. I mean, that, that's one of the problem of re reflective thing, you know. Uh, have to hide, <laughs> then you still just need to, to, to give uh, room for your measurement. So you can kind of lose your your central, you know, and the most one of the most signal power and signal to noise is from the center part. So uh, yeah, I, I'm not really sure. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks, Andrea, for your question. So if you have any other, anybody has any questions, please raise your hand and, and I think we have plenty of time to address them. In the meantime, I have another question for Esteban. Um, so what's uh, you, you mentioned that you can improve the resolution above what you get in a standard picture through that objective. So what's the limit on how much can the resolution be improved with typography? So uh, I think the this is a, a very good question then, uh, but, but basically the limit is, is uh, how much, you know, uh, how, how many how many LEDs you can turn on, you know, so as far as the illumination can go, but then uh, you're moving away, uh, then signal to noise lower down. So at the end, the, the real information, I mean, if it's only noise, it will, you basically miss your information. So, so basically the limitation will be uh, for this low cost system. Is basically, you know, uh, one of our limitations is the bit depth of our detector. So basically, the quantization effects of the detector, and if your signal is really above, you know, the readout uh, noise of, of your detector. So if we are, let's say, we get a five by five, we get more, you know, uh, illumination, then uh, we basically see, okay, are we above or not, you know, the, the noise floor of the detector? To see if we have any informative thing, and then we we can make a, a jump in resolution, you know. But then you can also play with the idea that okay, why not uh, boosting your light source, you know, illuminating with a stronger light, or using a longer exposure time, you get less noise. Yeah. So there's people that have been working, uh, thinking about this, you know, uh, on, on how to improve really the signal to noise of your measurements. So basically, we can go as uh, you can, there's people that have claimed doing, you know, uh, as people always mentioned, I mean, if you're using a 16 by 16, you know, uh, um, a, a thing, I mean, that, that's okay. I mean, and maybe it's impossible to get a, a 16, you know, X. Uh, it's very difficult because you, you have overlap in the Fourier, uh, uh, in your Fourier parts. So it, this is not just a perfect, you know, uh, you, you don't have all the information there. So, so there's something, it's really a trade-off. I mean, uh, I don't know. We, 
it really depends on that. I mean, I, I think uh, one thing is the practical thing, yeah, that, you know, how you, you can get stronger light, you can illuminate from road, but what, what people have been doing also to, to improve the illumination efficiency is basically using this sort of, you know, uh, sort of a spherical, semi-spherical kind of uh, illumination arrays, because then you're more efficient with your, your with the angle of incidence and you get more light. At the end, the problem is light in the detector and the noise. So I would say that realistically, at least we can get up to you know, uh, at least uh, improve twice the resolution. I mean, I think that that would be a realistic, realistic thing to, to do. I mean, if we can get from these three microns up to 1.5, I think that would be a very realistic thing with this system. Uh, even though, though I mean, uh, today with the Raspberry Pi, you, you can get better better detectors as well. It will be expensive though, you know, the, just the, a better detector will cost you 50 bucks. So it's not longer maybe uh, a low cost solution. So uh, you, you have, <laughs> I mean, everything with, is really that. I mean, you, I, I think you, you can get, uh, you know, up to, you know, uh, a better improvement, but like I mean, the original system, but that would be just a straight up, you know, hundred dollars versus you know, fifty k dollars, you know, and then maybe you get an explosive uh, demand. But of course, uh, to to help with the signal to noise, I mean, the multiplex uh, acquisition thing, it is very doable. The good thing is that with this system, you can play all that. You know, you can take real data with the multiplexing illumination um, and. And see, you know, that even in a, a very harsh environment, which is a very low signal to noise uh, detector, I mean, you can still get the, the improvement in resolution um, that you aim for. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we have one uh, question from Tobias, and, and uh, could be the last, or, or if anyone else has a question, please raise your hand. Yeah, thank you again, Esteban. I also found it really interesting. Um, it's a nice system. It's also nice to see that yeah, you're able to get your students engaged in these fundamental processes. And it's definitely one of these advantages, in my view, as well, these technologies that you can take them apart, you can change them, you can also do them at low cost, and you can really get playing and then see where the applications are going to. Um, but just while you were presenting, I actually had the thought um, I'm not sure if you've thought about this or if you have any response, uh, whether it, whether there would be any advantage of just recording the image in the Fourier plane directly. So if we're not really interested in the low resolution images in the first place, but our sort of raw data is the Fourier transfer, then transform of the image, then we record the image first and then transfer that into the Fourier space on the computer um, where we could also optically record the Fourier space. Um, and that might be, I don't know if, if that somehow might increase uh, the outcome. I'm, I'm not sure if, if that's really helpful, but it's something that could easily be done. I was wondering. And then also with the multiplexing that you mentioned, so I also saw some papers along those lines. So I guess you can turn on different LEDs in different positions at the same time so that you can reduce the number of images that you have to take and you still get very good results. And especially if these are, um, for the, so the high frequency images on the side where you get a low photon count on your sensor uh i was i think i guess that might help because you you have still several at least on so you might still get more signal in the end at the sensor so i don't know if, if these are practical trade-offs that you've tested or thought about yeah so uh um, talking about the second part of the multiplexing i mean you basically I mean, people started to do it not only by reducing the, the amount. So if you think about, you know, just applying some coded, uh, some Hadamard mixing of, of your measurements, uh, you, you basically just, uh, you can make the same amount of measurements so that there's no compressing and not, nothing wrong with it. Just, you, and you just get a boost in signal to noise. You know, you, you get your square root of N measurements, um, uh, a boosting signal to noise, and, and that can be advantages. And the inversion is very is, uh, uh, straightforward. And uh, you know that, that that's a very very good uh, advantage. So, but of course, if you do the coded illumination, you you can also start playing tricks with uh, more on the compressed sensing thing. And then, if you know that your signals are sparse and all that, then you can still improve your reconstruction. And on top of that, reduce uh, the the amount of. Uh, uh, of measurements at the end. 
So you can do it either way. Uh, and I think the good thing is that this system, even if it's cheap, it can completely help you and it's to, to really validate that uh, very, very, very easy. Uh, on the other side, uh, you know, when you mentioned that you're capturing basically the, the, the Fourier transform uh, straight and not, not basically you're not doing image, you know, of your object. That, that, that's, that, that's what, what, what you're meaning, yeah? So you basically sample the, the Fourier plane. Um, I mean, I think that that's more, even more related to the, the original typography thing. I, I, I think so, um, but uh, I haven't seen it. I don't know if uh, we have to do. Uh, I mean, we, we need to add uh, some lens or something else to to to, to get it. And I don't know how yeah. how would you handle um, I, again. Depending on the uh, illumination, uh, I guess the, the problem might be, you know, like again, related to signal to noise. I, I don't know because signal will be spread up. Uh, you get some really bright spots and a lot of dark area, I guess, on your chip, something like that. I was also thinking that might be a problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that, that, that can be an issue, but, but it's still an interesting thing. I, I don't know if other people have started, but, 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 but I think it, it's worth to, to at least uh, play with it. Very interesting. I would, I'd like to add another question, if I may. Um, sorry, around yeah, the whole take, architecture uh, that you chose. In the next few minutes. Go ahead, Tobias. Okay. Um, so about the whole architecture, because there's, it seems to me that there's one item in your setup that might end up being, well, it, it probably most likely is the most expensive part of your entire setup, but it's not really counted in the bill of materials because you need a, a computer with a MATLAB license for this whole thing to run and to control the whole thing, right? Whereas you actually do have a microcontroller and a computer in the setup, the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino. So I was just wondering why you chose that. So I guess you can run the MATLAB on the Arduino. So you would have to program with Python instead. Um, and, but then still there are LED sheets that work right on the, on the Raspberry Pi, like in this other paper, um, what was mentioned. I mean, there's, I mean, these are different shields. So I guess also the question which shield one can get uh, their hands on. <laughs> but I don't know, do you just use the Arduino because it, that's needed for this particular LED shield or did you have any other rationale behind this? No, no, no. Basically, I mean, the, uh, uh, for, for the LED array we had, it was just easier. Uh, just the uh, easy, easy thing to do. Uh, but but of course you, you can do it. Uh, it really depends on the LED array. I mean, maybe it has a microcontroller, and then you can talk immediately with the Raspberry Pi. That's no issue. And you're right. I mean, uh, software. I mean, MATLAB is not uh, uh, a cheap stuff unless I mean unless you are in Chile. <laughs> but anyway, uh, of course. I mean, this is only you know, Fourier transforms in playing in an iterative fashion. I mean, that this can be easily, easily transferred to, to Python or C or whatever. And, but on top of that, I mean, the Raspberry Pi is quite limited in, in the process. So yeah. my suggestion, I mean, if we want to do it this a little bit more professional, maybe spend a little bit more of money, uh, I will go for the NVIDIA Jetson. So the NVIDIA Jetson uh, costs hundred dollars, Yeah, you know, uh, has way more, um, and you can even run some of these uh, deep learning stuff inside and, 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 and will be a marvelous uh, companion here. But maybe it will start going against your low cost, yeah, your target. So, but, but, but as a matter of fact, I mean, you can also reduce the amount of uh, iterations, but also depends on how many um, illumination patterns you're doing. So there's lots of things that can add up to, you know, the, the, the processing time. So, I think that uh, we we can be we can I mean remove the computer you know instead of a um, two K computer a um, hundred dollar Nvidia JSON would be, be fine and um, Fourier transform works just fast or even some deep learning stuff and will be very very quick and and of course we can get rid of MATLAB this is just you know because that was that was available and ready to use. I mean, because we were mostly interested in, you know, trying to get the images and see if we can really reconstruct. 
rather than yeah, yeah because you were also using code from that was already written in a way exactly. and just modified so that makes yeah. sense so for, for these uh, th this was an undergraduate th thesis so uh it's really i mean was not focusing on oh, oh let's do it all as it should and that's why we, we never ended up you know publishing you know on a journal or anything like that we never uh kept playing with this at the end but we just just wanted to do some sort of demonstration thing okay we can do something cheap that can take images and can reconstruct high resolution stuff in white field of view. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much for discussing with us, anyways. Um, thanks. Thank you guys for, for the invitation. Um, very good. Uh, yes. Thanks a lot for uh, to everyone for the questions. And I, I think we have plenty of topics to continue discussions offline. But, but for today's uh, session, we'll, we'll leave it here. And, and thanks so much, Esteban, for, for your, your talk and, and explanations. Thank you guys. I'm looking forward to meet you in person and hopefully, I mean, you're going uh, there or either you guys can go come here and we, we can keep discussing and see if we can do stuff together as well. Thank you so much. Very nice. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye.